when the connection is that's yeah. how it comes yeah. about yeah. because they're yeah. curious and, 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 and then and another small yeah. constituency who yeah. comes yeah. in yeah. yeah. they know you yeah. they know you yeah. they know you explain the good relationships project for about half an hour um, he'll explain the work that he and others have been doing um, I'm then going to ask a very distinguished panel whom I'll introduce in a second to respond to David's um, thoughts um, I'll then ask them some extraordinarily difficult but very insightful <laughs> questions um, and while I'm doing that I want you to think about your brilliant questions that you will then ask us from the floor or online. Um, for reasons of technology, the online questions will be relayed by microphone by my colleague Karina, um, who's sitting uh, um, over there. Um, we finish at eight. Um, uh, so, um, welcome. Um, David Robinson um, is a community development uh, worker and uh, uh, well known in these parts as someone who has spent a lifetime developing innovative social finance mechanisms and someone who's managed to uh, be beloved uh, uh, on all sides, as you'll see from the Guardian quote in the biography that brought you to this room. <coughs> Kirsty McNeil, um, on my right, is the uh, Executive Director of Policy, Advocacy and Campaigns for Save the Children. She was a special advisor to Gordon Brown and currently chairs IPPR, as well as the Civic Power Fund um, and is on the advisory board of Scottish Futures. Most pertinent, I think, is she is the Labour candidate for the Mid Midlothian constituency in Scotland, so has an imminent election on her mind. Um, Gemma Mortensen uh, uh, is a friend, uh, a founder of New Constellations and the chair of More in Common. Um, she sits on the advisory board of Yale's International Leadership Centre and the A Political Foundation. So that's just a very brief skim uh, of their much more extensive biographies. Um, so welcome. Um, David, if I may, can I ask you to tell us about the Good Relationships Project? Thank you very much, Stefan, and thank you for having me back. And good evening to everybody, everybody in the room, and also everybody who's, who's joining us online this evening. It's, it's wonderful to have you all with us for this conversation. And happy Halloween. I am, I am particularly grateful to those of you who have given up opportunities to be terrorizing the neighborhood this evening. So uh, thank, you, thank you especially for joining us tonight. I, I've been thinking, Stefan, about why uh, Halloween has, has, has become such a hot ticket, and we, I hadn't realised this until we started to promote the, uh, this event this evening. And I guess it's, you know, it's fun, it's permission to be scary, it's, it's also something that we do together, we do in friendship groups, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we do as whole communities. And isn't that, isn't that really the magic of the thing? We are social animals randomly terrorizing the neighbors on your own would be no, nowhere near so much fun. <laughs> Bob Baldinger leads the Harvard study on adult development. It's the largest and, and longest of its kind anywhere in the world. He says, to say that human beings require warm relationships is no touchy-feely idea. It is hard fact. We need nutrition, we need exercise, we need purpose, and we need each other. So I want to suggest to you this evening that if you want to change the world, start with relationships. They are the groundworks in any society, the foundations on which all else is built. Effective education, just policing, stable childhoods, thriving communities, compassionate care, a fair economy, responsible government, flourishing businesses, even longer lives. Waldinger again, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. I know that embracing this uh, huge sweep from the intimate to the global 
invites some scepticism. But I want to suggest to you tonight that there is, is no task in adult life, public or personal, which is not done better with an enhanced understanding of relational skills. How to collaborate, how to manage bias and power and parity of esteem, how to forgive, negotiate difference and resolve conflict. Everything works better when relationships works well, work well. We think of that as a general theory of everything. And this is why in an age of Zoom, world leaders still cross the globe for face-to-face -face summits. Why decades later, adults still remember their best teachers, and why a study of 2,835 cancer patients found that those with a network of good relationships were four times more likely to survive than those without. Everything works better. And of course, the opposite is also true. US Surgeon General Vivek Murthy attracted headlines earlier this year when he said loneliness increases the risk of premature death by almost 30%. This shouldn't be new news. Twelve years ago, Julianne holt lundstedt looked at 148 studies looking at mortality rates across all age groups, genders and ethnicities. She concluded strong, strong connections increase the likelihood of surviving in any given year by more than 50%. Shadow Health Secretary a few weeks ago, Wes Streeting, told the Labour Party conference that there can be no solution to the crisis in the NHS without a plan for social care. He's right, of course, but there can be no effective plan for either without understanding these kinds of numbers. 6% of UK adults are chronically lonely. That's 2.5 million people who are more likely to get sick than the rest of the population and less likely to have the support they need to recover at home. It is good relationships, relationships in the community, that can reduce admissions, speed up discharge, and support sustainable social care. And in small projects outside the mainstream, that future has already arrived. In Frome, for instance, where targeted work on building social networks has reduced hospital admissions by 14% at a time when numbers elsewhere were increasing, and it cut costs. We cannot afford an approach to public policy that continues to marginalise the evidence and is blind to human nature. Relationships matter in every corner of our lives. But if putting them first is common sense, it isn't common practice. Practitioners who do it, like the team in Frome, organisations that work at it, like Barking and Dagenham Council, politicians who get it, like Jacinda Ardern, who told the UN, if I could distill down what I really want, it is simple, and it is this, it is kindness. These are still the exceptions in their field, largely one place or one term wonders, who, for all the good that they do, have yet to change the soul of the system that they inhabit. Their work is often transitory, fragile, adjacent, even maverick. Meanwhile, mainstream currents from local to the, to the global still flow very largely in a different direction. We see systems and services becoming less human, bigger, more remote. Organisational protocols and management structures redesigned to customise, not to humanise. Every interaction driven online. High streets, neighbourhoods and public services hollowed out with cash points and self-service checkouts and appointments on Zoom. None of these things are individually life-changing, but together and without offset, they chip away at our points of connection and shrink us into insularity. This is not the inevitable consequence of the technology. Machines enable the behaviours that we choose for ourselves and for others, but they don't make the choices. We work with a lot of people in big organisations who tell us about the management controls, the compliance regimes, the leaders with an almost visceral resistance to words like kindness and love. I think of the doctor telling us that her hospital training included the advice, you're not a person here, you are a professional. In the week of the global summit on artificial intelligence, I am as worried about human beings made to behave like machines as I am about machines being made to behave like human beings. I think there is a logic. 
I think there is a pattern in all this, a pattern shaped for the last several decades by strict adherence to the narrow logic of the market, fashioning the political discourse, bleeding into the ways in which we think about ourselves and one another, and setting an approach to our shared lives that is increasingly mechanical, individualistic, and impersonal. And my point is this, that pattern, that mindset, underpins not only the hundreds of thousands of local decisions, but also our approach to the biggest global questions, to how we care for the displaced, how we trade fairly and effectively across the globe, how we respect and share the natural world. These questions too, and many more, are all about relationships, about how we live together. And whilst we address them with a mindset, a, a deep code that is deeply unrelational, we won't meet the challenges of Monday morning, let alone of the next generation. We are not machines, wrote the late Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in 2020. We are people and people survive by caring for one another. Market economics and liberal politics will fail if they are not undergirded by a moral sense that puts our shared humanity first. Economic inequalities will grow. Politics will continue to disappoint. There will be a rising tide of anger and resentment and of loneliness, depression and drug abuse. All these things are related. When we see this, we have already taken the first step to a solution. If you want to change the world, start with relationships. Now, I understand those who will say, I get this for the little things, but the big stuff, the Middle East, for instance. Others are better qualified to talk about this than me. Here's John Alderdice. He was Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly at the time of the Good Friday Agreement and is also a consultant psychiatrist. He said the biggest step for us, the biggest step, was in understanding that resolving our problem was about dealing with historic, distressed relationships, not rules or constitutions. We know in our personal lives that the law can set down limits but doesn't make good relationships. It is understanding, he said, it is understanding, regret, responsibility and remedy, changing relationships that makes for new possibilities. Professor Neil Denton, our Relationships Project colleague and community mediator, tells me about time he spent with Zogby Al Zogby. He runs WAM, the Palestinian Conflict Transformation Centre in Bethlehem. The centre supports communities to build relationships that are, says Zogby, the roots that support the branches of future peace, justice and change. It is, says Zogby, the only thing that we can do and it is the only thing that will work. Now these words may sound hollow in the Middle East tonight. Changing relationships to make for new possibilities. Roots that support the branches. But equipping ourselves and especially our children to understand one another, understand one another better and challenging the paradigms that undervalue or ignore these relational skills surely is the thing we can do in every dimension of our lives. Relating well is a learned skill. I imagine an education system where relational literacy is the fourth R. Thoroughly and systematically taught from university, from nursery to university, a world where no professional training is complete without the relational component, from basic proficiency to depth and excellence. And a time when our leaders at every level put relationships first, systematically, and our organisations, large and small, are institutionally relational. Five years ago, the Relationships Project took its first steps towards this world of good relationships endeavouring to balance that big picture vision with practical constructive work on the ground. Large-scale problems don't always require large-scale solutions, wrote David Fleming. They require small-scale solutions within a large-scale framework. We've been building a body of knowledge about those small-scale solutions, gathering stories and data, developing the language of relationship-centred practice, of relational offset, bumping places, relational poverty, because until we conceptualise relational behaviours clearly and consistently, there could be neither shared understanding nor collective action. We've made tools and led training. We ran the Relationships Observatory, studying shifts in relational behaviour, particularly during the pandemic. And working with others, we've made the Relationships Heat Map, 
the kit for councils, the relationship maker's guide, the active neighbours neighbors field guide, the bridge builder's handbook, and other practical tools used by organisations across the UK and further afield. And we've started to join the dots to build a field of practice. We're mapping the many brilliant organisations and individuals who put relationships first. We set up the Relationships Collective, learning from and with the servant leaders who together represent just some of the pioneers. And we convene communities of practice and run the relational councils and now the learning uh, network. Over the last five years, we've worked with many hundreds of organisations, large and small, voluntary and statutory. A mutually supportive, still small, but rapidly growing and ultimately regenerative field is gathering strength, but it is also facing obstacles, two in particular. First, what we call the frilly fallacy. The leaders who say, I get the relationships are important, but my top priority is dot, 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 something else. Exam results, for instance, or school attendance rates. With respect, no. Because you won't get any of those outcomes unless relationships are good. Child to child, child to teacher, teacher to family. The order is everything. Putting relationships first is everything. An approach that we see repeatedly vindicated, even in the toughest circumstances, perhaps especially in the toughest circumstances. Daniel Aldridge studies the impact of disasters. Following the Japanese tsunami in 2011, he found that the strength of social capital was more significant in determining the level of fatalities than the height of the sea wall. The social infrastructure, even more important than the physical. A startling finding at first glance. But then, these are communities who notice one another, who know who's least likely to hear an alarm, who needs help to leave home, whose transport or shelter on high ground. It's obvious, really. Just as it, as it is obvious that it would be those same communities that recovered and rebuilt first and most effectively. Both findings emerge repeatedly from disasters around the world. Writing most recently about the August fires in Hawaii, Aldrich concludes, these consistent findings should drive home to policymakers everywhere the critical importance of close ties. Relationships first, the fundamentals, not the foolies. And the second obstacle, the crunch, the capacity crunch. I don't have time for this, people say. Repeatedly, we hear systems, we hear of systems and practitioners petrified by well-intentioned, often piecemeal additions to their day, demanding more time on something other than personal connection. Dr. Gillian Sandstrom, director of the Sussex University Centre on Kindness, says we want from our services and those who provide them competence and warmth. What we get, says Alec Fox, CEO of the Mayday Trust, is hostages to a system. We need to declutter, says Dr. Claire Gerarda, president of the Royal College of GPs, to empower staff to remove the clutter that has accumulated in the space between the doctor and the patient. And there is recent precedent for doing this in many fields. In our relationships observatory, we found countless examples in lockdown where rules were trimmed and relationships trusted. Trusted. That too often is the missing piece. Paul Morrison, with us tonight, led the Government Homes for Ukraine program. He told our community of practice that this swift and effective response to crisis was built on trust, trusting councils and community partners, real, strong, reciprocal relationships. Not, as Paul acknowledged, the usual approach for government, but the only one that could work, just as it had done repeatedly in the pandemic. Trusting, decluttering, Focusing on relationships with all the messy differences is not without risk. But how much better would it be to get the most effective behaviours wrong every now and then than to get the least effective behaviours right over and over again? Learning from all our work over the last five years, the Relationships Project is now embarking on a new five-year programme with three intentions. First, to continue to develop our collective understanding we're developing the interdisciplinary learning network with, so far, over 100 academics and researchers from more than 40 academic institutions. 
The network will help to build confidence within the academic world, share learning, develop collaborative lines of inquiry, and establish the wider credibility that comes from the rigorous study. Ultimately, we envisage university hubs driving up the breadth, depth, and profile of relational practice. Our second intention, to unlock connections. We're building a patchwork of practitioner communities, serving and connecting the people who are putting relationships first. Some are subject-specific, our relational councils network, for instance. Others cut across specialisms and topic areas. All are igniting, in the Fleming phrase I used earlier, small-scale solutions within a large-scale framework. Our third intention, to embed relational practice. Margaret Thatcher changed Britain with a vision of a property-owning democracy, saying, economics is the means, the end is to change the soul. Focusing on relationships between people rather than between people and the state or people and the market is a big soul-changing idea, effectively a third era in post-war Britain. But whilst practice may be growing, too much is still below the radar. Changing the soul of systems and of organisations, embedding these approaches, is our long-term goal. We're setting out plans for the Relationships Academy, working initially with five cohorts from different fields, supporting future leaders as they develop the mindsets, the skills and the processes to become exponents and enablers of relationship-centred practice. One cohort, for instance, will be prospective MPs, working not just with the, with the next-term government, but with next-generation government. To provide content for the Academy and access to all our resources for the wider field, we're also building a pattern library, weaving together all our resources and tools. Our mission across these three intentions is not to invent, but to understand, establishing the Relationships Learning Network, to connect, building the patchwork of practitioner communities, and to embed, developing the Relationships Academy for future leaders. Our method, of course, is relational. We have a tiny team and work largely associates and partners. If you would like to play any part in that, we would love to talk to you. If not this evening, then do please message and we will follow up afterwards. And these are enticing developments, I think. But my 3 a.m. question to self is, are they realistic? I can really only answer that like this. I've spent all my working life with people in difficult circumstances. I've seen how many problems are caused or exacerbated by broken or inadequate relationships, and also how repairing relationships or building new ones has the power to change lives. I look at other organisations and other people doing transformational work. Almost always, relational practice is at the heart of the model. So I come here with, with people in my mind, lives that were changed and lives that weren't. And I have no time at all for pretty ideas without utility. But I'm also impatient with councils of despair and the politics of low expectations. Hope is a discipline, a practice, wrote Marianne Kaver, and practice makes progress. During the pandemic, we practiced and we progressed, noting one another, connecting differently. Nine million people voluntarily caring for one another, almost 40% having done little or nothing before. At the Relationships Project, we called this the moment we noticed. The better angels of our nature were suddenly flapping everywhere, wrote historian Peter Hennessy. The banging of the pots and pans were the sounds of a people rediscovering themselves. We moved in Professor Putnam's phrase from a me to a we society. None of us were untouched by the pandemic. The only question is whether we are open to learning, to the learning, and willing to embrace the behavioral evolution that it prefigured or whether we retreat to the old ways, knowing them to be inadequate. The opportunity, says Professor Hennessy, is still there for the taking. I think so too. And I also agree with Dr. Peter Little, or Dr. Michael Little, who says, a small group of activists with the right idea delivered at the right moment can change the mindset and behaviors of millions of people. He cites the development of Wikipedia. Two moral agents, Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger, had two agents, uh, two ideas and two principles. They now have 115,000 active editors producing 6.5 million articles, accessed more than 250 million times every day. 
Michael calls this social contagion. We too have the moral agents and an expanding base. Also proof of concept, many exemplars and pressing crises, all the seeds of a positive contagion and the conditions for spread. Together with others led by many, this journey has begun. And I'm almost done for the evening. But I want to end with a, a memory from the start of my career. I was trying to build support uh, uh, for what became Community Links, uh, the organisation I talked about in, in the first lecture and that was my mothership uh, for decades to come. I was working in a, a children's home and I met Patrick, a particularly troubled young man. We struck up a, a rapport that he didn't really have with the older staff. And towards the end of my time there, uh, we were sitting together at the end of the garden. It was a hot night in July. The younger children had all gone to bed, almost dark. And I was about to leave at the end of the week. And I decided I would tell him what I was trying to do with Community Links and I would be going uh, at, at the end of the week. And I've told him uh, all about this. I was, I was full of enthusiasm and I, and I guess of a careless insensitivity. And I can see him now. He stands... He walks back up the garden, he stops at the back door, he turns round, he's lit by the bright lights of the kitchen behind me, and he shouts down the garden, I wish I'd never fucking met you, Dave. Then I'd have never had to fucking say goodbye. And he didn't. For the rest of that week, he walked out of the room when I walked in, and whenever I went back to the home thereafter, he did the same thing. Some years later, I bumped into the family social worker on Stratford Station. She told me that Patrick took his own life three days before his 17th birthday. Now, I'm not suggesting this evening that he took those pills because of me. I was far too insignificant for that. But if I wasn't part of the problem, then nor was I, as I had once fondly imagined, part of the solution. I was just one more passing ship in Patrick's short, dark night, and none of us laid anchor. I've made many mistakes since then, but I didn't repeat that one. I stayed at Community Links for 40 odd years. <laughs> I'd learnt about the importance of real, reciprocal, sustained relationships, about what we can do as individuals and as parts of a system and about what, maybe inadvertently, we do do. And I'd learnt that we can't change anything, anything of substance, without attention to one another, without noticing what philosopher Simone Wheels calls the rarest and purest form of generosity. But if we do put relationships first, we can improve lives. We can start to move the way people feel and think, rewrite those deep codes. We can embed the shift in the way systems and institutions behave, the little things and the big stuff. And we will change how we live together. If you want to change the world, start with relationships. Thank you. I'm not going to comment. I'm going to go straight to Kirsty and ask for her responses to your uh, to your lecture. Thank you. And I would like to pick up one of the things that David said at the beginning about why we're almost allergic about talking about love. And um, this past weekend, there's an organisation that I hugely admire called Who Cares Scotland, and it organised something called the Love Rally. And it does that every year. It's a membership organisation. It fights for young people who've had experience of the care system. Their strap line is they want a lifetime of equality, respect and love for all care experienced people. And this rally that they do is a march to advance the idea that there's such a thing as a human right to love. A human right to love and be loved. And I've attended a few of these rallies because my own mum had experience of the care system and I go there to honour her. Last year I experienced something that I'll never ever forget which is, I was marching behind a young woman 
who was holding up a sign that she'd made and it said, I got restrained more than cuddled in care. That has consequences. And tonight I just want to sit with the consequences for her, for the person doing the restraining and for all of us. So if we begin with her, obviously the most important person at the centre of that story is the young woman. Um, what she had experienced was a sense that the state had told her our only obligation to you is to keep you alive and to make sure that you don't present a danger to yourself or to anyone else. She felt she'd been told that by the state and therefore by all of us. She did not feel that she had been told by the care system, the clue is in the name. She didn't feel that she'd been told by the care system, you are unique, you are utterly irreplaceable, your life is of infinite value and we want to share it with you. And these kind of problems are most acute in the care system, but of course they're not restricted to it. So today one in four people, young people aged 17 to 19 has a mental health problem. That's gone up a massive spike from one in 10 just in 2017, six years ago. Now just under one in 10 young people say they feel lonely often or always the highest number of any age group. It is unconscionable to me that we would allow a generation of young people to feel so afraid and so alone. And that's what happens when we don't recognise that it's a human right to love. All of this, all of this breaks my heart. But do you know who else's heart? It probably broke. The person doing the restraining. And so I want to reflect on them for a moment too. So by day, as mentioned, I work in a humanitarian children's organisation and anyone that works in one of those organisations know that you need to be on the lookout for something called moral injury. So moral injury occurs when you have no good options in front of you. You're in a high stakes situation and everything you want to do kicks against your training and your values because you have no good options. So the term was originally conceived uh, from people dealing with uh, people suffering for it in the military, people who felt that their commanding officers or their civilian authorities had lied to them and made them go against their honour codes. And in the humanitarian sector, we most often identify in people facing the so-called humanitarian dilemma. And the humanitarian dilemma is when you feel pulled by your training and the thing that brought you to your vocation, pulled between the obligation and responsibility you have to speak out and bear witness to what people are experiencing and your equal and opposite obligation to stay in situ neutrally so that you can continue to deliver life-saving assistance on which people are depending. So I've been thinking about moral injury my entire career that I've been working in internationalism. But what shocked me was the number of people that I encounter now that I do more uh, domestic community work, the number of people in the front line of our community organisations or our public services who are experiencing it too. And lots of you will remember um, little Awab Ishak, who died in a mouldy house, despite the fact that his health workers and health visitors had <coughs> repeatedly sent letters saying that he was in grave danger and he might die, as in fact transpired. And when I was trying to process the fact that that had happened in our society in this century, I asked a health worker that I knew, like, do you send letters like that? And she said, all the live long day. Despairing, she said, I do this all the time. So do my colleagues. And we do it knowing that the person who receives them can't do a damn thing about it. So I send letters knowing that the housing officer on the receiving end has as little power as me because there just isn't enough decent housing stock to go around. I think, too, of the youth worker who said it is impossible to make a mental health referral from our youth charity unless the young person has an active plan to do catastrophic harm to themselves that day. If they don't, they simply cannot be prioritised. So we have an entire generation of community workers, youth workers, public sector workers who've been turned into gatekeepers to resources. And it goes against everything about their training and everything about their values. So tonight I want us to ask, what do we think that does to the spirit? What do we think it does to the soul of those people? 
They know that they have a calling, a vocation, not a job. They've been brought to that despite all their skills, all their qualifications. They pay a huge salary sacrifice to do that work because they desperately want to be of service to other people. And they know that the best way to be of service to other people is to form proper relationships with them. But they simply can't in the way that David described. And I would argue that's because 13 years of austerity have created a relationships calamity. 75% of doctors who were surveyed by the BMA said they found the description given to them of moral injury was resonant with what they were contending with. So today, by design, we are breaking the very people that we rely on most because we are subjecting them to moral injury. And we're doing this to the people whose work doesn't always make the headlines but always makes the difference. It simply can't be sustained. And so that brings me to my third point. If it's not sustainable, it has consequences for all of us, a society in which people cannot be supported to have the relationships that they want and they feel called to in our public services and in our communities. That society is one with terrible consequences with every last member of that society. And it's, there's the consequences that can be measured in the way that David described, in lower productivity, in higher crime, in poorer health. But we know too, and this is why this is so enraging, we know too, not just the consequences of the absence of relationships, but what happens when they are present. Because we see it in our charities, in our community groups, in our public services every day. We see it when there is a nursery worker who takes the extra time to help a child learn through play. We see it in the supermarket checkout worker who takes that extra moment because they know that the person in front of them is unlikely to be speaking to anyone else that day. And those people don't do it because they've been told to. Quite the reverse. They are often, as David described, doing it in spite of the incentives and the instructions that they are subject to. They do it just because they know instinctively it is both the right and the meaningful thing to be doing. So I want to leave you with one suggestion about how we might think about this differently. What if instead of the systems that we have allowed to be designed and to which we are party. What if instead of those systems, we decided to build ones that had that human right to love at their core? What if we stopped feeling squeamish about it? What if we took that lesson from Who Cares Scotland and we said, the question for all of us with every single decision that we make day by day, because our society is nothing more and nothing less than the sum total of the decisions that all of us make every day about how we're going to treat one another, what if we said we will ask ourselves of every choice that we make, will this contribute to or inhibit the creation of loving relationships? Now, David said that we face a frilly fallacy, and that very much resonated with me, because I know what I'm saying <laughs> sounds a bit woo. Right, it, ju it just does. In policy-making circles for uh, folks who work at the Treasury, for folks who do commissioning, this can and does sound a bit woo. But the reason I would encourage you to have confidence and take comfort from the fact that we might actually be able to adopt relationship-based practice as the norm is people used to say equality's impact assessments sounded a bit woo too. People used to say that sustainability was a bit woo too. And now it is utterly routine that before we spend public money or make serious choices about how we live together and implement policy that you would do an equality impact assessment and an environmental impact assessment. So I think we've got a great start in the way that David described the next five-year strategy of the Relationships Project. I am wild in particular about the Relationships Academy and its willingness to work with future politicians. That is where we must start. However, my challenge tonight is that cannot be the end. We'll only know whether we've reached the end if that young woman tears up her placard and Who Cares Scotland thinks it doesn't have to march anymore. Thank you, Tess. Right. Gemma. Well, thank you both. I found um, those, both of your remarks very moving. And um, I wanted to just bring in two examples, one that came to mind when David, you spoke, and it's very different to the one Kirsty mentioned. It's, I think, you know, less 
less hardcore, um, much more routine as a daily example, but I think points to what we're experiencing in terms of the displacement of the importance of relationships from how everything is being governed um, at the macro and the micro level. And then the other is just an example from some of the work I do in one of the organisations I'm involved in, which um, which we came to because we decided that um, just as individuals we no longer wanted to accept the ways that we were told we had to live and work and to discover for ourselves what it would be like if we did things from a place of love. So, um, so in terms of, I live in, I live in Dartmoor, so uh, that's um, a, one of the national parks of the UK. Um, it's in Devon, and it's wild and remote. And it also, um, my colleague Lily, who's here today, um, said that when she came to see me, she said, I, it's like I live in a, a Postman Pat episode. So <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know what Postman Pat is, and there's no reason why you should, he's a postman who um, goes around in, a, I think, Yorkshire village and knows absolutely everybody. Um, and it takes, it's almost impossible to get anything done in the place where I live because you walk out the door and within 100 metres you have said hello to four, well, you said 60% of the residents of the town um, of all ages um, and uh, to give you a, a sense of this place um, David you mentioned that today was Halloween it's also Samhain which is the older pagan festival that preceded the kind of uh, commercialist rampant chocolate fest that we now know and uh, we have a vicar or had a vicar in our uh, in this town called Chagford on Dartmoor Whoop Chagford where um, such was he a master of relationships that he would um, be obviously hold space for Christian worship um, Christmas, Easter, etc. But he would also, on all of the pagan festivals, collect the non-Christian worshippers, the children, the adults, and he would congregate us around something to do with nature and help us mark the turning seasons of the year. And I've always found these unbelievably moving occasions in which people across the town, the small town, kind of came together to experience this together. It's also a place where, in the local swimming pool, we're very lucky we have an outdoor Lido which is fed by the river. It's Dartmoor, so these things are possible. And the blue plaque, like the ones that you see where famous people did something there, is made to a woman called Pam Pigeon, who is probably about, you know, many generations Dartmoor. And she volunteered so many days of her life in this swimming pool that there is a, a blue plaque up to her. So this is a, this is a place where, um, where relationships run deep and they run thick. And um, it has it is been a very, very different experience for me coming into a place like that, having lo- lived in London for many years. And it's also something that's at risk. So uh, my kids go to the local primary school in the, in the town. And um, it, in the summer, they put on a play, uh, which is in a... Am- it, well, I say amphitheatre because it's outside. It don't get any grandiose ideas of what this is. But it's got a very nice view that was made by previous generations of, of parents at the school. At the end of the uh, performance, the headmaster asked everyone who had themselves performed on that lawn to raise their hand. I cannot tell you the number of people who raised their hand, and some of those were four generations in a, like... So they were seeing their great-grandchildren perform on a a stage, on a piece of lawn that had been made by the community in, in years past, that they themselves had performed on. Now, that same school within the last year has been made part of an academy chain, And um, now, instead of actually relationships, what is starting to dictate is efficiency and cost-saving because the years of austerity that Kirsty have mentioned are hitting everywhere. And we are now in a situation where uh, there's no... that The school shares a headmistress, a head person, with two other schools where they sacked or moved the, the, the school administrator so there's no one to answer, no one at the school gates anymore. And you had memories of parents who used to go into the school classrooms with their children, knew all of the teachers. When this woman, Elaine, amazing, amazing woman, left, I, I kid you not, 80% of the parents that morning were in floods of tears, as was she. And what we talked about in parents when we were ruminating on the consequences of, 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 of Elaine being moved on in the name of efficiency was the Elaine ripple effect. Because when you went to drop your kids off, you were a bit sheepish and late and you saw Elaine, Elaine smiled at you and she made your day better. And as a consequence of that, I, your, how you then interacted four or five or six times in a small community 
had a huge, huge cascade effect. And it made that kind of community possible. It made a community possible where you did look after each other's kids, where you fed anyone who knocks on your door, where if there's a, um, a, a, an elderly person who looks after your house, it's your responsibility to help them sort that out. And that's going. And one of the questions that I would ask you, David, is, I think it's incredibly laudable, everything, and necessary, vital, indispensable, everything that the Relationship Project is being set up to do and deliver. And I also ask the question, is it possible to do this by positive propositional work when the system, which has had its soul sucked out, is, has become um, such that it is now incapable of valuing or creating the incentives that do allow space for this kind of relational work that you have um, talked to and Kirsty has talked to. And I, I actually think there needs to be almost like a pincer movement strategy here, one of which is to do that positive work and the other is to keep taking on what our market economy has been debased to. It does not need to be like this. It is possible, David, we were just talking earlier that you were... You know, one of the things that you've done in life is reimagine how the financial system can value things more than only a, the, a, a, only profit. Only, only the, um, but we have, to, we have to ask ourselves, what do we value and how do we value them? Um, and then the final thing that I just wanted to um, remark was in New Constellations, um, we uh, set that up, as I say, to be able to operate from a place of love. And um, Lily, who's my colleague in the audience, will do that to the extent of handwritten notes to people. I mean, like, the, the extent of kind of TLC towards each person is immense because what we found when people who are so different from each other come into a process that enables them to ask really hard questions about what is this time that we're living through? What would it look like if society was rooted in a very different set of values? People go through a very, very emotional process of realising what it actually feels like to be back in relationship with people who aren't like us, who are different. And I think that we're losing that experience, one that is visceral and wonderful and like an experience of love itself. And um, we have to find these spaces in which, as you are doing, David, people are taught how to build relationships, but also these spaces in which we protect those moments where we can connect with each other deeply, 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 deeply and beautifully, because I think it's only through that reconnection that we'll realise what we stand to lose and also just how delicious and wonderful that experience is when we get it. So, yeah. Thank you, Gemma. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. Um, David, Gemma had a question in there, about one paragraph up from the end, about whether you need to connect the kind of propositional positive work that you do with something which I guess sounded to me more radical and more political, and whether both of those things need to happen. Could, do you want to answer that one first, and then I'm going to come back to you with a frilly fallacy question. Yes, I think we need to have a go at this from all angles. Don't yeah. it's, it's, it's a big job. Um, I, I, I would pick up the point you made, uh, uh, Gemma, about efficiency. And I think the, the bit we've particularly got to challenge is that those kind of market solutions are even efficient. And I, yeah. I would suggest that, that what Elaine was doing in the school and the impact she was having on that wider community was, in fact, a far more efficient... She was getting far more efficient results from that than uh, might, be, might, might be achieved now. Uh, and I think we, 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 we mustn't be afraid of judging this agenda against the usual, the usual ways in which we judge outcomes. You know, we must be prepared to say the school can achieve good education results. We can reduce antisocial behaviour. We can do all these other things we want to do in this community in a different way, and we can do it better. Mm. And I think that's the bit that we've really got to challenge as, 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 as vigorously as we possibly can. So. Okay. so on that theme, I have a question. And while I'm asking the question and, the, and it's being answered, start thinking about your questions. Um, it's a, I guess it's a kind of frilly fallacy question. And, and I don't want to be cast in, in the role of sceptic here because I completely endorse and believe what you've been saying. But one of the things that we know about relationships is they also manifest as bad relationships. And one of the things we've done in this financialized, marketized, contractualized economy is shore up the risk against bad relationships by having things like contracts. 
okay? because, mm. because relationships go wrong. And the only thing worse than not having one is having one that goes wrong if you don't have a contract underpinning it. So I guess, I guess my question is, what do you do with that kind of paradox? Or, or perhaps you want to argue it isn't one. And I'm going to, I'm going to want all of you to have a go on this, on this one. David first, and then and then Kirsty, and then Jan. Well, I think a couple of things, Stefan. I, I would certainly say that you know, everything I'm talking about this evening, when I frequently use the, the, the word relationships, when what I'm actually talking about, of course, is good relationships. I absolutely, accept that some relationships are bad relationships and toxic relationships. So we're talking about good relationships here, and I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that relationships are more important than anything else. What I am suggesting is that they are the basis on which we achieve and which we do everything else. And that idea that we put relationships first. So, of course, we need other things in place as well. You know, we, there is a place like for contracts. contracts. Or, yeah. There's a place for transactions. But relationships first is the key thing I'm, I'm, I'm emphasising here because we build everything else on top of that. Kirsty. So I wonder if, and um, Brenda and I were talking about this earlier, I sort of feel that societally we are in the midst of a transition and transitions are always agony and they always involve reversals as well as um, attempts at progress. And I wonder if we're not in a binary where everything is either relational and assumed that it needs no navigation and no framework or contractual. I think we might be moving to a world where there is greater collective accountability for behaviours and they're not just assumed, relationships are not just assumed to be between two people but are assumed to be held in common and in trust for all of us. So I, I, I hope and feel that we're sort of on the brink of a stronger sense of power is not best regulated contractually, it's best regulated by being dispersed. And the more that we can kind of break down hierarchies and have people feel free to challenge and I'd say to, to hold everyone to account for the best of themselves and not the worst of themselves... <coughs> Like, I, think there, I think there might be another leg to that stool beyond relationships and contracts, which is a sense of power held in common. Gemma? Yeah, um, I think the... Um, I th I mean, well, I mean, this, is, this feels very, this is very personal <laughs> because we are now... We were, when we moved to Devon, we actually met. We are doing a big house project and we actually came across people who don't use contracts for house projects, such is the thick web of social relationships there, that the, your, your tr your, the bond of trust is a better guarantee than a contract. I appreciate that. It's a very freakishly unusual situation. And yet it exists. And I think that part of one of the things that we're seeing that I think people are reacting against in terms of a workplace that they want to work in or a school that they want to send their kids to or any kind of the systems, a healthcare system, is that we are, um, have become so risk-averse, management has become so risk-averse, that there are so many layers in place that are there to take away the risk of a bad relationship eventuating, that I think we have um, suffocated and stifled people's ability or freedom of manoeuvre to actually create the good ones. Especially in governance of, pu of public benefit organisations. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that, that has to be unpicked. Um, it has to be unpicked. Okay, um, it is time to um, hear your brilliant questions. I think there is um, a red t-shirted um, microphone person within, within reasonably close proximity. Um, I'm going to start um, uh, with um, Karen up there and then move my way around the room. So I don't forget, I, I'll try not to forget you, those of you who have your hands up. You don't have to keep them up. Thank you very much. A really, really fascinating lecture. A thousand questions, I will stick to one. Um, this really touched on um, South Africa. Um, and I was going to stand up here and not talk about the rugby, but I actually think the rugby really does <laughs> show something relational, which it surprises me that everybody is surprised by which is how strong those ties are beyond what you expect to be day to day. Mm -hmm. And I was privileged to be able to do studies in South Africa, which is the world's most unequal country in very unequal parts of the country. And what it showed is how strong community embedded relationships are to hold um, the fabric of our day to day together. But David, I think this is very particular to some of the comments you were making, which is, 
those relationships are enabling, but they're not necessarily empowering. Which is when you do need that extra something, the magic of a rugby team, to enable people to step up past what they know. And I'd be very curious to hear a bit more from you as to what you think about that as a concept, that relationships are enabling but not necessarily empowering, unless we can encourage people to step outside of what they know. Thank you. David. I think this is what I was talking about when I said about the need for relational education. And uh, it, is, it, it strikes me as extraordinary that beyond the most basic biology, we do so little training in, in how to build and sustain relationships that are both enabling and empowering, to understand the distinction that you're making uh, this evening. And I absolutely agree that thinking about the power dynamics in any given relationship, you know, when we talk about the relationship between teacher and child or uh, doctor and patient, you know, there's clearly an imbalance of power. But the, those relationships can still be reciprocal if they are constructed thoughtfully and carefully. And I think being much, much more thoughtful about the nature of the power relationship, its relationship with trust, and how we can construct relationships that are genuinely reciprocal. We are, we are, we are nowhere on that kind of agenda in almost every aspect of our life here. I absolutely agree with the point you're making. I think we could be doing far more on those, you know, and achieving far more as a result of that if our understanding was more sophisticated. And that's what takes me back to thinking about education throughout the, the, the education system, but also very specific training, you know, every kind of professional training, and that's what we want to think about in the, the work of the Relationships Academy, thinking about how we work with, with leaders, but leaders in every, every, every walk of life. So they may be in the middle of an organisation, they may apparently be on, on the front line of an organisation. There are people who are leading the thinking, leading the development, and uh, adopting a much more sophisticated understanding about how we, how we think about our relationships. Thank you. I'm going to go first here, and then five rows back on the right-hand side, and then I'm going to go to the middle bank. Um. Hi. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you all of you for uh, that sort of really rich and fascinating uh, evening so far. I guess, so one question and one very quick challenge. Um, the question first was, it seemed that both all of you actually referred to, in your, in your remarks, around um, centering this discussion on... Uh, uh, a advanced capitalist economy or the elements to do with the way we, we're living now, particularly in, in the West. And I wonder, um, do you think there are examples from elsewhere in the world, either in place or time, where we were able to put relationships more at the forefront of our decision making? And if so, how can we learn from that? And then my very brief challenge to, to Jeff was, uh, I love your story of, of, uh, from Devon and uh, someone who grew up in the West Country. Uh, that resonates with me to some extent. But my challenge is, I think, actually, day-to-day -day life in London, and now as a proud Londoner, is much more, uh, or it's equally about uh, good relationships mm -hmm. by the fact that there's 10 million of us that day by day basically get on really, really well. Uh, and despite our annoyances with each other, most of the time, most people get on well, and I just want to challenge this idea that uh, a good relationship means knowing your neighbours, and because some of us enjoy the anonymity and the chance to interact with lots of different people, and so I just wanted to, to bring that out. We don't all want to live like Postman Pat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> who wants to take the um, Bhutan or somewhere else question? Um, uh, well, actually, the final thing you said really resonates with me because I come back quite a lot. Um, as you might imagine, my job involves staring into the abyss a lot, right? Because <laughs> like I look at the worst, right? But like I like by day look at the worst things that people do to each other um, around the world. And the thing I keep coming back to is Desmond Tutu said in his book, like actually you should be very invigorated when you see bad news. And the reason he said is because it's on the news because it's unusual. It, it, it is literally news when people harm each other because actually not just millions of Londoners but billions of people around the world make it through every single day 
without harming mm. each other or causing unnecessary suffering. And that's actually something to celebrate and to reflect on and, and to hold on to in these terribly, terribly difficult times. So I agree with you that actually we might be able to look at Bhutan or we might be able to look at Froome or some of the other examples that David's made, but we might actually just be able to look around our own life yeah, every good. day. Great answer. Gemma? Um, <laughs> So I think, I mean, the answer to your first question is yes, for sure, many across many periods of time in many places. And that's uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, to the, your second, I mean, I agree with you. Like I've, I've lived as, I've loved the anonymity of London and I'm not sure I want to live in, you know, like Postman Pat either. I think there's, I think in what you're saying also is the fact that why do we like anonymity? Because close relationships that you can't escape are difficult. And um, we, we've all been there. We all know what that's like. Like, there is a, you know, I feel in your quote, like I feel in your remark, you too have had experience of this. Like, there is an upside and there is a downside. And I think with, um, you know, the reason why we've both, well, I think all responding to the idea of an academy is this, this stuff does have to be taught. I think, like, um, it is not easy to... Uh, to um, the processes we run, which are taking people through like very, very deep um, p- periods of questioning about really big stuff, it is not easy to do that with people who see the world very differently to you. Um, and I think this stuff needs to be taught and it needs to be held. Um, and um, and both of those things, you know, are marvels. The fact that we can withstand close relationships despite the difficulties, and the fact that we can live um, together anonymously but beautifully is, you know, these are these are these are all wonderful facets of relationships. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's five rows back on the right-hand bank of chairs. Um, thanks. Um, so as someone who does very, very relational work, and this is, to some extent, amusing that I have for myself a lot of the time, which, you know, ultimately, all of our relationships are mediated through our culture and what we frame as good communication, good emotional intelligence, being a person who is desirable to be around. That's also linked to systematic and structural oppression in a very profound way. Even things like being conventionally attractive mean you are more likely to earn more money, you are likely to live longer, because people want you around, and all of that. So my question is really how can we centre relations, relationships and relational work more in a way that unpicks that and opens it up, rather than entrenching that privilege and that oppression? Who wants to start with that? That's, I'm going to ask you to go first to that, Gemma. Um, so, I think to go, I, so, I, so I think that's, it's a good question. And um, I can only speak to it through how I've observed groups working together. And I'm sure you will have, you know, you would be interested to hear what your answer to your own question is as well, to be honest, because you obviously have a lot of experience um, in, in the, that it's coming from. But um, in the groups that we've worked with, where there are people who are very, very different from each other, so some people have a hold what we would call kind of established positions of power, and some people are powerless in a conventional sense. And um, I personally have seen people go through a process where um, a sense of hierarchy becomes dissolved because the nature of the conversation that is being had is of a different type and of a different nature than people are allowed to have in conventional workplaces or in conventional encounters with each other. Um, And what emerges from that is um, often actually a subversion or reversion of what a conventional hierarchy would be, if that makes sense. Actually, Actually, the people who become those who are listened to or deferred to or become, in a way, the wise elders, I don't mean in an age or a generational way, it's a subversion of what you would normally see in a kind of conventional p- power differentiated situation. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, again, going back to this idea of um, the Relationships Academy, this is all the stuff that needs to be unpicked. Because I think if we expect different kinds of relationships or a different feeling of relation- relationality to emerge 
from doing things in the same way, in the same kinds of spaces, we, we're not going to get new patterns, um, which is, I think, you know, why this project and, uh, is so important. Thank you, Gemma. I know, I know there are lots of questions stacking up, but I'm going to go just briefly to uh, the online community, people who aren't in the room. Um, and Karina um, is going to read out a question that she has chosen from the many that are coming in online. Um, so Jenny Dunn asks, these relational approaches of love, trust and solidarity are or have been in the past inherent in marginalised communities as a necessity for survival. How do we recognise this and support this as a way of relational working from the grassroots level? Well, I mean, I think, I think these two questions are profoundly connected and really important, and um, so thank you for asking them. Um, my sort of historic sense of practice is, like, you can't solve problems you can't name. So, like, even naming that our status quo is, like, profoundly unequal and absolutely riven and morally disfigured by um, oppressions and injustices is the starting point. Um, so I think, you know, both questioners, like Gemma, I'd like, love to hear when you've seen systems being disrupted or replicated, right? Because there, there's only two options when you're faced with an unjust system. You can resist it or you can replicate it. Um, and we have absolutely, in the way that that second questioner has described, seen them resisted and dismantled and something better built um, in lots of spaces and lots of places over lots of times in the way that Gemma is described. But the first, the first step has to be naming it and acknowledging it mm. and not gaslighting people that it's not happening. Uh, so like, bringing that into the room, I think, is incredibly important. And I'm grateful to both questioners for doing so. Okay, thank you. Could um, I just add one, please, one please. Um, one, one, we absolutely wrestled with the uh, the questions that the, the, the issues that Gemma raises. Um, one, one of the things we've been trying to do with the relationships project is to avoid doing what all my life in the voluntary sector I have thought we we did do, which was essentially we identify a problem, we you know we draw up a sort of constitution for the organization of the group that's going to tackle that problem we apply to the lottery to get some money we get a bit of money to employ three workers and, and buy a filing cabinet and then we <laughs> sort of put the frame around the problem that is that big and we we go out into the world and we do that thing and we are a little bit irritated by other people who say they're doing that thing because we, <laughs> we, you know, we now own this thing now, you know, we've tried to not do any of that with the Relationships Project, which is to set it up. We have a, uh, an organisation called SHIFT, which provides us with fiscal hosting, so we're not even constituted in a formal kind of way. We are really just a network of people, of, of, of associates and collaborators, that are interested in these issues and trying to push forward on this agenda. And that is absolutely the way we intend to develop the, the Academy and everything else that we are talking about. And I think that it is only by operating in that way that we can have that breadth of engagement in the issues that we're talking about. So I wouldn't begin to think that I could competently answer Jem's question on my own. The point is that we need to in, in, engage every, everybody in thinking about this stuff because it is relevant to all of us. And we need, therefore, to be very, very careful about what is the kind of structural framework that we put it into. And that's really what we try to be thoughtful about. Still, after five years, you know, we don't have an organisation around these things. We're beginning to develop and support the development of a field, support the development of a movement, but it's something we're in together. It's not something that is led by, mm. I hate the phrase, not something led by social entrepreneurs. Heaven forbid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, first, um, I think about four rows in in the middle bank, and then about five rows down in the middle bank, um, and then you're being very patient. Uh... Hello everyone, my name is Charles Owen. I run a company called European Pubs, and in my venues um, a lot of relationships start, develop, um, so I'm very interested in this. I, I actually went to your lecture five years ago, David, I found it fascinating. You talked then about the concept of relationship capital, um, and I was very interested how the project had developed in terms of how you might go about measuring that and the work that you might have done in that area. We, we, our, our thinking about measurement is, is, is really, a, a, and there's an entire conversation to be had about this and an entire event about it, 
but thinking about it in two ways, really. One about measuring the strengths of a relationship, and there are other organizations, many organizations that have, have engaged with this very thoughtfully and do good work around it. The other is how do we measure the effect of a good relationship on all the other things that we want to achieve? And I think in making the argument, particularly the public policy argument, it is the second bit of that that we need to get much better at. I think you know, the work that, for instance, the GLA, I think there might be one or two people here from the GLA have done around measuring social capital. I think we've kind of got a handle on how to do that reasonably well. And to, the, the work I talked about, Daniel Aldrich, in measuring social capital in those areas which were uh, affected by the tsunami. We broadly know how to do that. It's, it's the relationship between that and the other things that we want to achieve that we are not so good at. So it is that we find commissioners of public service contracts going out saying, you know, what we want to achieve is reducing antisocial behaviour or any of these other things, and then coming back to us with the fully fallacy argument, we understand why relationships are quite a good thing, but still, what we really want to do is, is to reduce antisocial behaviour. We are only going to overturn that argument, or turn that argument round, by being able to measure the connection between the social capital and the outcome we desire. Work in progress. Love to involve anybody who's thinking about this kind of stuff as well. Thank you. Um, in the middle bank, about five rows down, please. There you go. No, there you go. Exactly. Thank you. Um, <coughs> David, you know I love you and your work immensely. <coughs> I'm sitting here feeling a bit kind of anxious. I'm feeling anxious for two reasons. Firstly, because hopefully Kirsty is going to go, well, hopefully she'll go into the political system but one that is riven by people who hate people in other parties almost as much as they hate people in their own party who <laughs> try to stop them getting to the top and to do what they want. And, but the real reason I'm feeling anxious about all this conversation is because when you speak to this you know, beautiful but relatively small audience, Jordan Peterson is speaking to 15,000 people at the O2. And the relationship that Jordan Peterson is trying to develop is to tell you who to follow and who to hate. And I think unless we get the politics of relationships, of progress, of modernity, of beauty, of kindness and compassion right, those people are waiting for us to fail. And there's a lot of them, and they're incredibly well-resourced, and they're incredibly ambitious, and they're, you know, they're incredibly intent on building the, exactly the wrong kind of relationships. So I want some urgency to this, and I want some vitality to this, to do it at scale and at speed a lot faster. Kirsty. Yes, I'm pretty anxious too. Um, <laughs> and the, the, one of the experiences I had that really shaped my thinking about this was we went over uh, to campaign for Hillary Clinton, right? And from, from this side of the pond, we were like, this guy is so angry and so obviously from a character point of view, utterly disqualified from holding high office and just it felt so negative. But interestingly, when we landed and started listening to speeches with American ears... It's like, no, this guy's actually telling people that things can be better and that things can be great again. And despite the fact that the politics were hateful, they were reflecting to people a profound sense of optimism about their future. And likewise, what Jordan Peterson does effectively is tell young men that they have agency and that they should have pride and that they may feel utterly wrongly on the basis of all the data about the differences between uh, men and women's experiences in the world and the kind of um, misogyny that uh, restricts women's lives. He is saying to men, you're not wrong to th think the thing that you think. You're not wrong to think you're hard done by. And I can show you a future where you're not hard done by. So for me, the real lesson for progressives is if you are not optimistic about the future, we will always lose out to people who are, and I used to do loads of training for women who were thinking about going into public life, and we'd make them like draft leaflets and draft hosting speeches and draft um, press releases, and it would always be, where we live is utterly shit. <laughs> Elect me. I was just like, like wh why would anyone <laughs> pick as their representative somebody who's not full of pride and energy and hope and optimism about the community where they live? So <clears throat> progressives have really got into this habit of talking 
areas and people down and talking negatively about the future and not talking positively. So I think that's, that's the real lesson. But I think you are 100% right, Neil, that the antidote to all of this is being in relationships with people such that they can even hear you. So the problem is progressives have often had the wrong story, but they've also not even been heard because they're not in relationships with people such that people can get brought back from the brink. And actually, we know that one of the biggest drivers of extremism of all sorts, one of the biggest drivers of extremism in our society is loneliness. It's, you know, people, people join far-right political parties because they have barbecues and punk nights. And, I mean, that, I mean that, that's just what Hope Not Hate's data tells us, that places where people feel left behind and people who feel isolated are attracted to the far-right because it gives them a sense of belonging. And if progressive movements are not uh, giving people that sense of belonging, then our message, whether optimistic or pessimistic, won't even get heard. OK, um, we're at the point now where we need to speed things up because I want to come back to everyone on the panel and ask for them um, to, to make their final, as it were, call for action. But you've been very patient, so I'm going to ask you for a question. Then I'm going to, I'm going to get all of you who've had your hands up and then mash all those questions together, but formulate the question as a question, not a comment. And then we'll see which ones we still have time to pick up. So go. I have uh, loved ones in both Israel and Palestine now. Uh, ten years ago, I spent three weeks in the desert in Jericho uh, with an intentional community, a group of Palestinians and Israelis coming together and trying to live together in this space. Uh, it was work. It wasn't easy. Eating together, living together, praying together. There's a culmination of a moment where we're sitting on the campfire and a fighter jet, a fighter jet flies over us. And to some people, this was a deep source of reassurance because the fighter jet sound meant protection. For another group, it meant uh, fear and terror. But because of the relationship building, we were able to hold hands and share tears over shared recognition for safety. And that moment, for me, sparked a turning point in my life where I saw the power, the power of relationship building. So af after that moment, as a school principal and even as a father, although my eight-year-old still challenges me, I, I, the power of relationship is very strong. Uh, Gemma, you said how to value and create incentives for relationship work, and David said we need to challenge measures of efficiency. So what do new incentive structures and measures of efficiency look like when we look at relationship work? Which of you wants to take that? Gemma. Well, um, first of all, I commend the work that you did there, and that's a very beautiful story, and I think, um, yeah, rays of light in very dark times. Um, Maybe one anecdotal story. So there was um, one of the uh, uh, towns that we worked in was a, is uh, called Barrow in Furness, which is in the northwest of the UK and is a very, very deprived place. And coming out of that, the group, there was a, uh, a man, um, a widower who used to have been mayor of the town, working class um, Barovian, and a, a young man who um, was... Uh, Represented the LG, LGBTQ um, I, uh, cohort of submarine workers across the country. They build all the nuclear submarines in Barrow. And at the end of this um, process, uh, Tom had spoken very, very uh, movingly about how he finally felt safe to live there. And John, as a um, much older older man, had kind of um, had said, "I, you know, he had expressed his." his care and love for this younger man. And the audio of their experience was, they took it into a council meeting. So it, it, it's on YouTube somewhere. A council meeting which is a, was a very kind of, you know, um, not an emotional place. And um, the reaction of the councillors, who were moved to tears, hearing this group of people, different citizens from this town, said, maybe we should not be looking at um, the numbers of people served, uh, quantities, Maybe we should be measuring things in terms of love. And so my, my reply to your question is, what does it literally look like to measure things in terms of love? I think we have to ask ourselves things that sound crazily woo. I think we need to, I really do, because if we're going to stop behaving like or becoming machines, we have to bravely, defiantly, courageously reconnect to our hearts and our souls and the things that make us human. And we have to ask... How does that become manifest in what we value? Mm. And that is how we have to start talking. 
I was going to ask everyone for a call to action at the end, and that sounds like you got in, you got in before the end. Um, so remember that, everyone. Right. The, the questions from people. I'm going to get as many as possible. First person in the middle of the middle bank on the on the end of the row, and then and then uh, at the back in the middle, and then uh, over there at the top. And I'm going to run all these questions together, and I'll try to remember them. And be as brief as you can, please. Further up, further up, further up. There, yeah. Uh, I'm going into work tomorrow, and I'm going to issue some notice to seek possession of a number of social tenants because they can't afford to pay the rent. I believe that's to do with the housing crisis and the economic crisis. Tell me how this relationship project can help me. Mm. Okay, good question. And the tenant himself. Um, right at the back, same, same bank. I figured out both personally and professionally is that there's a need when you're talking about relationships to also do work on yourself, deep work on yourself, to be able to be one of those very important units in building these relationships. So to what extent does the initiative take that into account in terms of working on yourself? Great. Um, the, the left up there at the top. I've lost the microphone. Hello, it's here. Oh, it's there, okay. Hello. I didn't see you, sorry. Um, so, um, how do we better ridicule thinking that acting like a machine is what we want to do on managerialism? How do we successfully, I missed the verb. How do we better ridicule? Ridicule, yeah. Got it. Okay, last one is just over there. Um, we've been talking a lot about systems, but like the person over there, I think my um, question is about personal practice. So um, I draw a parallel with something I've been hearing or observing a lot in um, campaigners and social justice activists, which is especially the younger sort of generation of activists, which is the recognition that changing systems and challenging systemic injustice and caring for others requires a lot of emotional toil and personal... Um, um, energy and emotion, and therefore self-care is just as important as sort of such a journey of caring for others. So, um, um, how how would you advise other relationship practitioners um, to? Uh, what would you advise them to do, or top tips, or standards that maybe you hold yourself to account um, in terms of how people, how individuals do their relationship practice? You can't have deep, beautiful, okay. loving relationships with everyone, right? Mm. Thank you. Okay, four questions, two of which are essentially about self-care or emotional um, work. Um, uh, one of which is, what do I do tomorrow if I, the system I'm trapped in requires me to make people homeless? Um, uh, and the third is, how do we build better ridicule, or, 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 or in other language, how do we better attack the systems that are causing these problems. I want anyone can pick up any or none of those questions. I just want to hear a final word from everyone on the panel before we close. And I'm going to start with Kirsty. Okay, so I think I think we have to get comfortable working on two levels and at two speeds. And by that I mean the question about is the relationships project the answer to the system that you're trapped in, sir? No. Right, because it seems to me like you're experiencing the exact moral injury that I talked about, <laughs> that you have gone into housing work to help house people securely, not the opposite, that we are all trapped in systems. So I feel like our relational practice and certainly the relationship project as one sort of locus for that, necessary but deeply insufficient. Right, politics is the answer to that, because politics is the process whereby we reallocate resources and power peacefully in our society and that a better politics were built on relational practice but as I say it's necessary but insufficient so I cry every single polling day every single one without fail and the reason I weep every single time is because what an extraordinary thing that we do and going back to your remarks sir like we say to people we have never met and will never meet I want to take your fate into my hands and I'm going to put my fate into your hands and together we're going to find a way to navigate this and we're going to have huge resource transfers affected with the flick of a pencil, right? So that's just relationships scaled. So you have to participate in that and vote with your values if you want to have a different system that is properly resourced so that everyone can flourish. So we have to operate at this meta level. But as the questioners have said, we also have to, met, we have to operate at an individual level as well because our lives are mediated through individual interactions that we have every single day. And that's why the Elaine effect is so profound. So David said hope is, hope is a 
discipline. I also think love is a decision. Mm-hmm. So, like, this idea that love is a feeling is, like, for the birds, right? And anyone who's been married a long time will tell you that. Like, <laughs> it, it is a decision, and you make it every day to say, I am going to behave in a loving way towards you, regardless of your behaviour. I'm going to behave in a loving way to you today, and I hope that that will be reciprocated. And, like, we scale that in society. So just the thing to do tomorrow is just decide. Decide to be loving. So, you, so you've, you've done a Gemma thing. That's your call to action. Very good. Gemma, and then last Get this word woman today. elected. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, on, the, um, on the ridicule point, I think this is a very serious question, because, uh, so there's a very amazing man who I had the pleasure to meet once called Serge Popovic, and he was, has written a very brilliant book, I think it's called How to start a revolution it's something like that but it was about how um in the um uprising again in serbia there was um the use of humor and how actually that that was very 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 important because to ridicule in a way that reconnected people with laughter and made people realize that something that had become normalized was absurd and unhuman was actually the most effective way of reconnecting to people's hearts and minds rather than this seeming like some kind of distant ideological something. So actually, I think the question of how to ridicule, not in a way that is pejorative and derogatory, but how to ridicule as a creative way of helping us see things afresh is actually quite a good and serious question. Um, and then in terms of... Um, uh, in terms of... Uh, Sir, when you said that, like, oof, I... I feel your day tomorrow. And all I can say is imagine if the work that you do was created from a root of what would it look like if you were able to go into your day tomorrow through relationship. And, um, and looking at your, how you ask that question, I'm sure that the way in which you will go and have to do things which must break you apart tomorrow the way in which you will do that from the kindness of your face will make a difference to those people tomorrow. And um, how, how sad it is that you're not given more space to do that. Good answer. David, last word to you. Uh, on, on, on the point of ridicule, um, I, I think one of the fascinating things about talking about this is I could go around and ask every single one of you about a relationship that's been important in your life. There, there is something about this that we all, we, we've all experienced relationships that are important, good relationships and also many of us have experienced bad relationships and, and I think that's the place at which we need to touch people so I, I, I take your point about ridicule and I think there's, there's an interesting idea there but I think really try to, to, to hook on to why how relationships have changed our individual lives but how it is that we behave differently when we become parts of a system or a structure and help people to understand the distinction between the two and one of the things we've been doing in the Relationships Project is developing the practic- practitioner communities that I-, I mentioned earlier, which is really about supporting one another in that process, but also trying to, to focus on some of the-, the really difficult issues which it throws out, including, for instance, in the councils network, thinking about how does this connect with the cost of living crisis and the work that is going on in councils at the moment around that. So m- part of my answer would be, and, and linking into my call to action, uh, 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 Stefan would be to uh, you know, have a look at the, some of the work we're doing around that, have a, have a look particularly at some of the work we're developing around what we describe as solidarity spaces and practitioner communities so we can support one another in the, in the development of this work and also perhaps have a look in, in relation to the point about self-care and the moral injury questions which, which Kirsty raised earlier we've been doing quite a lot of thinking about what, what is relationship centred practice and it isn't just about being nice to one another there's some really <laughs> vigorous and thoughtful ideas here how do we develop that more carefully what can, what can you add to the development of that kind of thinking uh, and, and help us as we begin to, pro- to progress this agenda in ways that, that gets it taken seriously and also helps us to take helps us to do it better Uh, and so my call to action would be come and join us (laughs) so So the easiest um, um, bit of the job is to thank this amazing panel uh, to say that um, David should not wait five years before he does the (laughs) next public lecture at the the LSE Um, to thank my colleagues uh, who organised this to thank anyone wearing a red 
T-shirt and, and, and moving microphones around to thank Karina uh, for um, uh, voicing the, um, uh, the online people um, uh, to um, invite you to join the relationship project world and community and to invite you to drinks outside this room now. Thank you. <laughs>